All righty, folks. Buddy as well. We are continue with our lecture. When we last met, we had talked about uh, nu nutritional requirements and binary fission, and then we talked about the standard growth curve. So we're going to continue on with that discussion, and we're going to talk about um, the population formula. And then we're going to talk about ecology and things that can affect things that can affect growth in a population. Right? So as we talked about the standard growth curve, we talked about the fact that the standard growth curve could be used in application to study lots of different things, right? So uh, an infection, um, food spoilage, um, growth in a, in a, on a culture medium or in a broth, right? So all these things can be taken into consideration when we think about when we think about the growth of microorganisms, especially bacteria that are very predictable in the way that they're going to multiply, right? Binary fission. And now it can be applied to a lot of other things too, but with bacteria, because they're so predictable, they're easy to they're easy to talk about when we talk about populations, right? And so I'm going to introduce you to another application. Um, a population formula, a population equation, if you will, that we can take a look at these things. And that population equation is right over here, right? And so you can see it's NF is equal to NI, G, I mean, times two to the G, and that G should be the superscript, right? So the equation is the final population is equal to the initial population, right? times two, and two is a constant for binary fission, to the number of generations, right? And so that's the way we can look at this thing, right? And so now you know all the different variables. So I made up a little scenario, right? And so a little scenario is this, right? So here's the population equation we're going to be using. But here, here's the scenario, right? So we're invited over to Aaron's house to study for an exam. We're supposed to get there at 10 o'clock, but I am an overachiever and arrive at 7 o'clock in the morning. Because I arrive early, Aaron's a little bit grumpy with me because I'm there early, and he puts me to work to make tuna fish sandwich for our lunch uh, on that day. So I'm making the tuna, tuna fish sandwiches, but I sneeze, and when I sneeze, I sneeze into that big old container that I'm making tuna fish in, right? And I simply, since nobody's around, I just simply hide the evidence by mixing in whatever came out of my sneeze into the food, right? So I'm a known carrier of Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram positive coccus, right? And it's also the number one etiology of food poisoning. So etiology simply means cause, the causation of. So I make the sandwiches and my task is completed by eight o'clock in the morning. And in that initial sneeze, when I sneezed into the food, I I um, inoculated approximately a thousand CFUs into that tuna fish, right? But the amount of sandwiches that I make are just so much that they don't really fit in the refrigerator at Aaron's place. So he puts them in a large container and he stores them at room temperature. And then we, everybody comes over and and we have lunch about 1 p.m. So the problem is, the question is, how many cells were in that particular tuna fish? How many total cells were in there so that they made me sick, right? And so if we think about that for just a second, um, you can see that we can set it up, right? Because we know, right, the pop, we, we know the equation. We know that the organism is a gram-positive coccus, and that gram-positive coccus um, has a generation period. One cell becomes two cells every 30 minutes, right? We also know that the initial population was 1,000 CFUs, right? And we know that I started making the tuna fish sandwiches. And the tuna fish sandwiches uh, were ready at 8 a.m., but they were stored until 1 p.m., 
when we consume them, right? So that's five hours. So how many 30 minute segments are in five hours, right? And so if you think about that, one hour is 60 minutes. And so there are two 30, 30 minute increments in each hour. Therefore, my number of generations is equal to 10. So now I have enough that I can solve the problem, right? And the problem is simply solved by taking the equation and then putting the numbers into that equation. So here's the equation. So final population is equal to the initial population, which is a thousand CFUs, right? Times two to the number of generations and the number of generations is 10, right? CFU. So if we think about that, uh, and of course, as I start this lecture, I don't have a calculator. Uh, with me, but that's okay because we know that every every generation, one cell becomes two. So therefore, I can figure out very easily how many cells are going to be there just by simply doubling the population ten times because there's a lot of different ways to do science, right? And so if I start with a thousand, right? And from here on out, I'm gonna use M Roman numeral for a thousand. So that's gonna be 1000, right? So my first one will be 2000, right? Then it'll turn to 4000. Then it'll be 8000, right? It'll be 16,000, fourth generation, 32,000, fifth generation, 64,000, sixth generation. And then it'll be, uh, let's see, 64 and 64, 128,000, right? 256 thousand uh, let's see five hundred and twelve thousand and then lastly it'll be one million and twenty four cells so that final population is one million uh, 24,000 CFUs is what made me or what made us all ill, right? So that's how you use that equation. Okay, so take a look at that equation, um, practice a couple of times. And then we can, if you have questions, we can make up another scenario and have a good time trying to figure out what it might be, okay? So that should be your answer. 1,024,000 CFUs, okay? All right, so now that I've done that, you know, that, that's gonna be on the exam. There'll be something you'll have to answer with that. I might even make it part of the uh, take home but we'll, we'll figure it out. And you guys will have some kind of equation like that, that you'll have to figure it out. I can manipulate that particular equation lots of different ways. It's just an algebraic formula. And so it's easy to manipulate. Okay. Let me know if you have questions. So as we go on and think about this, then here, of course, is my garden. I told you, I'd show you more of my garden. Here's some plants that we're going to plant, although they're inside the house right now. We made a little greenhouse on our back porch because it's pretty cold out there, as you know, but of course this is during the summer and you can see this, you can see over here is kind of my, uh, 
we call it the orchard. We have lemons and apples and we have low quats um, and we have um, some blackberries and dewberries and a bunch of other things out here that we can consume. And then this area here has been converted to a garden. Right? And the reason the backyard works so well is because of our compost, right? So I've got three composts going. You can see this one is kind of mid midway through. This is ready to go. It's even growing things out of it. And this middle one is uh, our third one. And so we're putting in new stuff here. So we're turning it, we turn them over quite frequently, add a little bit of water and a little bit of uh, manure, whatever kind of manure we can get. So there are some people who live in the neighborhood that have rabbits and they give us some of their manure. We also get um, horse or cattle and we can mix it in there. That's all you need really because that's where your microbes are gonna come from. And so that's pretty cool to think about how that might work, okay? So here's my composting area here and it works really well. You can see <laughs> it grows things even when it's not supposed to be growing. So here's kind of some of these pictures that I showed you all together. I have a very fruitful backyard, not right now, it's frozen, but uh, hopefully my, uh, my fruit trees will um, survive. Okay. What we want to look at now is really our planet, and and you guys may not may not think about this very often, but the the planet is so dynamic, right? It's a combination of consumers that includes us. These are organisms on the planet that eat other organisms, and then there's the producers, and the producers are the plants and the algae and some of the bacteria, right, that produce food substances, nutrients for other organisms, right? And so here, if you think about that for just a little bit, and you, I kind of played with this a little bit on your first take home, but it's so fruitful and really it's all about the microbes, right? So a lot of people think the microbes are bad, but I'm here to tell you a very, very small percentage of the microbes are bad, right? Less than 0.1% of all microorganisms are bad. All the other organisms, all the other microorganisms on the planet do something good for the planet. And so what we're gonna continue on is looking or discussing or investigating what things, what factors might influence the growth of microorganisms, right? So that if we're interested in understanding how they may grow, right, we've already talked about there are requirements for different types of macronutrients and micronutrients. And we talked about how we could incorporate that into media. We talked about how the population works. We looked at algebraic formula for which we could think about what the total population for, by colony forming with single cells. And, uh, and now we're gonna kind of look at some factors that can affect growth. And those factors are, of course, the oxygen, right? Temperature, pH, osmotic pressure. And when we talk about osmotic pressure here, I'm not going to really be talking too much about it, but I'm going to be, I will talk about hypertonic environments because um, hypertonic environments are what a lot of foods are at. And the reason they're at hypertonic environments are to control the microorganisms, right? And then of course, nutrient concentration. So for some of you who had uh, MIFA 1406, you know that we looked at enzymatic reactions and we looked at, at nutrient concentrations. And so all these things can affect growth or affect things that might be working because enzymatically, if you knock out whole enzyme systems and you really stop cellular metabolism, you stop growth. And if the cell doesn't grow, then it just simply dies. The first topic that we want to address are, is oxygen. And this is easy because we've already talked about this in the lab. So aerobic, facultatively anaerobic, microaerophilic, and then um, aerotolerant and um, an anaerobe, right? And so we know what these things are already. So we can just define them real quickly and I'll just define them real quickly for you, right? So an aerobe is an organism that needs oxygen in order to propagate, right? A microaerophile, again, 
file meaning to love, micro meaning small amount, and aero meaning oxygen. So these are organisms that need a small amount of oxygen to grow. And they typically are going to grow around this area where there is a little dissolved oxygen, but uh, not very much because they just need a small amount of oxygen, right? Facultatively anaerobic organisms, you can see them, they prefer oxygen, but they'll grow throughout the tube. It doesn't really make a difference to them, but they prefer oxygen, right? And they're tolerant, they'll grow throughout the tube. It doesn't make a difference to them, right? With or without oxygen, they don't really have a preference. They're going to grow throughout the tube. And then lastly, you have your anaerobic organisms and your anaerobic organisms are only going to go toward the, towards the bottom of the tube because oxygen is toxic to them. Now we know that, right? Some, um, some of these strict anaerobes can use other types of elements or um, molecules as their, as their final electronic sector. And so it's pretty interesting to think about. Now we're not going to get too far into that particular construct, but but just to think about it, it's pretty interesting, right? So if we were to have a little test, you could see that this is an organism only growing at the meniscus, so it's an aerobe, right? This is growing slightly below the meniscus, although it's hard to see because of the angle and the way the image was taken, and about about maybe halfway through the tube, and so this is an organism that is a microaerophile. Here you can see the organism mostly growing at the top, right, but then growing throughout the tube, and you can see there's less growth um, in the rest of the tube, so this is a facultatively anaerobic organism. And then here you can see the organism. This is what happens when it's overgrown, right? So this is an aerobe. I'm sorry, this is an anaerobe, right? No oxygen. And this is what happens when it's overgrown. So it starts to push up, but it's not going to get near that area of the thioglycolate tube where there is oxygen, because remember, oxygen is toxic to an anaerobe. Okay. So there is one other term I want you to know, and I mentioned it a little bit, and that's a capnophile. A capnophile is an organism that prefers higher concentrations of CO2. Likes a little bit of oxygen, but it really prefers CO2, right? Um, the most important pathogen that we're going to study is Streptococcus, right? Now, Streptococcus, um, it's found a lot of different places, but if if you think about it, it's causative agent is strep throat, right? Streptococcus pyogenes. It also is normally found in lots of other places, right? But Streptococcus pyogenes is the most serious of all pathogens. Not only does it, um, uh, not only does it cause strep throat, but it can also cause things like necrotizing fasciitis, scarlet fever, lots of different things, right? Sorry, my it's kind of late and my dyslexia is playing with me a little bit, so <laughs> I had a little trouble spelling that for just a second. But uh, if you think about this for a minute, then this organism is found in the back of the throat, right? Because it likes that CO2 and there's lots of CO2 coming up from there. And so it's likely to cause, if, if the balance of microbes in, in the buccal cavity in the back of the throat are off balance, right, then this organism can come up and it can cause problems. But it can also cause problems with the, with the, with the fascia and other parts of the body causing necrotizing fasciitis, okay? Lots of other species of uh, Streptococcus are found a lot of other places, and we'll be talking about some of them as we get into um, the course a little bit more. So we've talked about now oxygen. Let's talk about another attribute that can, can that can really have an effect on population growth. And those are, it's gonna be temperature, right? So there are really three types of organisms when we talk about temperature. They are the sacrophiles that like colder temperature, right? The mesophiles like middle temperatures and then the thermophiles like warmer temperatures, right? So. There is a little bit of overlap, and I'll show you that in a little bit. For the scope of this course, I don't need you to know, I don't need you to know ranges. I just need you to know that if it's if it's refrigerator or colder, organisms like sacrophiles are gonna grow, right? If it's room temperature through body temperature, and maybe just a little bit warmer than that, 
than the, than the meso files you're gonna grow, then higher, right, than body temperature where thermal files are gonna grow. So thermal files will never grow in our body because even if we have really high temperature, even if we have really high fever, we're just not gonna be hot enough uh, to sustain or to really support the growth of a thermal file. So thermal files just will never grow in us, but they will grow in compost piles, right? So uh, uh, you may have heard this if you grew up in on a ranch or you grew up in the country, maybe somebody told you never put wet hay in the barn. And the reason that they said that was because if you put wet hay in the barn and the measles files kick in and start to propagate and start to grow and they produce heat because remember one of the um, one of the end products of the cellular respiration is heat, right? Then it might get it warmer if the thermophiles kick in and when they kick in, they can get the inner core of that of that hay bale really, really warm. And so to have a fire, all you just simply need is heat, an oxygen source and some fuel. And so you have all three and therefore your hay can actually spontaneously combust. And so when the nerds get together, um, at a conference sometimes and we have a bunch of young folks we start to talk about you know some of these fires that may have started a long time ago where a lot of people think you know that maybe it was animals that kicked over a lantern and started a fire but we sometimes believe that maybe it was the thermophiles that actually started those fires right so where you think that these organisms cannot grow right the frozen tundra right these are ice cores that can be taken and when you do that you start to study these ice cores and you find that these sacrifices can grow there right they they are happy in that particular environment and that's a pretty really cool way to think about my god life can exist just about everywhere right and not only that but um you know they can they can survive in your refrigerator right so your refrigerator a lot of people think that if you put things in, ref in the refrigerator, it's going to kill them. No, it's going to slow down their metabolic rate. Even if you put things in the freezer, you're not going to kill microorganisms. You're going to slow down their metabolic rate. Hence, if you put beef or a steak in the freezer and it stays there a long time, it can degrade and still spoil, right? Well, we'll, we'll basically say that it's kind of tastes terrible because it's got freezer burn, but some of them may be attributed to the fact that uh, the microbes continued to grow in there, right? So when I was doing research um, as a as a young microbiologist, I my one of my jobs was to make sure that any of the new strains of of bacteria that we had or whatever, that I would keep those strains in a purified way. And what I would do is I would test them to make sure they were pure, and then I would put them in a glycerol freeze and I would freeze them at negative 60 degrees Celsius, and they would stay there forever. Anytime we need them, we'd just go in there, take that little tube that I had them stored in, and then just simply take a little bit, put it on media, and we had cultures anytime we wanted them, right? And that was pretty cool. Uh, nowadays, uh, even ACC, you know, we just simply buy lyophilized cultures, freeze-dried cultures, and then we rehydrate them, and they're ready to go. I think you can buy lyophilized cultures or freeze dried cultures uh, at the grocery store. You can find these little caplets or cap or or um, capsules that have microorganisms in them that would be, uh, you know, good for the intestinal tract, right? And so you can take them when they get into the intestinal tract. The capsule breaks apart, and then all the microbes are in the small intestines, and they keep your small intestines actively healthy right and there's lots of research that says when that happens that um that your your body works optimally and you have less problems with ibs and depression and all kinds of different things right uh, and so it's really interesting to think about mesophile like middle temperatures that's what meso means file meaning loves middle middle temperatures and these are these are organisms that are going to grow best around 20 to 40 degrees uh, Celsius. Now there is some crossover and I, I will show you that. But again, remember, I just want you to know that if they grow at refrigerator colder, they're gonna be a sacrophile at room temperature or body temperature, mesophiles, and then warmer, a lot warmer in some cases, 
then body temperatures are going to be thermal files, right? So these these are really interesting to us because this is the area where most of the human pathogens really like to grow, right? Between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius. Now, not all of them, but almost a big a big percentage of all of the human pathogens will grow in that in these mesophilic conditions, right? Hence, if we were to take a look at one of the pathogens, this is Staphylococcus aureus, you can see that optimally they would grow best at about 35 to 37, right? So you can see this is about 35, but about 37 is body temperature, right? So even if you put them at 22 degrees Celsius room temperature, they'll grow, but they're not going to be as happy. As you get it warmer, right, 30 degrees Celsius, a little bit warmer um, than then room temperature, right? They're going to grow. But look at body temperature. Man, these things are just loving it, right? They just, because they have evolved with us. And so as, as, we, as we have continued to evolve, the organisms that are part of us that become part of our microbiome or our microbiota, or an old term was uh, normal, organisms or normal flora, then those organisms have also adapted to us. And that's why organisms can be human pathogens, but they won't be pathogens to other organisms because the, the temperature of their particular body isn't going to be supportive of them, right? So you can see that Staph aureus at 22 will grow, but won't be very happy. At 30, it'll grow. It'll be a little happier, but at 37, boy. Does it really like that? Okay. And then we leave that, we go to thermophiles, and you can see that thermophiles will grow in really, really warm conditions, right? And so this is kind of a, a, a thermic pond that's associated with the volcano, an active volcano, right? But really, one of the coolest things that I ever saw were, we used to think that the geothermal vents in the bottom of the oceans were just so warm that nothing could live near it. But I can remember there was a, a series in on the National Geographic uh, channel that really talked about these geothermal vents and how they have become kind of a new area of study because where we thought there was nothing down there that could grow, we now know that lots of different organisms can grow. And it all starts, of course, with the bacteria and the archaea, right? And so um, the archaea grow down there, the bacteria grow down there, and they provide really the foundation for the food web, right? And so other copepods and other small protozoans will consume the bacteria and other small crustaceans will consume those things and then smaller fish can eat the smaller crustaceans and it just goes up from there so eventually you have these larger predators down there at the, at the depths of the ocean where we there's still a lot of things unknown there I, if you can remember back um when the great tsunami hit the pacific rim there were over a thousand different organisms that washed ashore that we had never seen before. They came from the depths of the ocean, right? And so lots of people are studying those now. And so it's pretty it's pretty interesting to think that, you know, that's that's something we don't know very much about still the oceans, yet uh, we are overfishing them and putting great pressure on them, right? I saw another um, I saw another uh, Discovery Channel episode where the area around uh, some of the uh, around Cuba, some of the reefs there are just so pristine because they're not overfished. Uh, they don't have all this stress on them. And so there's so many, there's so much wildlife in those areas, right? And so I just hope that we can see the importance of having having areas like that in the world where we can protect them and allow them to continue to thrive, right? And so that's pretty cool, for at least for me to think about. So there is some overlap of these different organisms, right? You can see, and I'm not really interested in you guys looking at this overlap, but I just want you to know, remember that sacrophiles are going to grow in the refrigerator, right? Um, and colder than that, mesophiles will grow uh, room temperature through body temperature, and maybe a little bit more than that. But the thermophiles are just simply going to grow outside of the range 
of where the human body, and so we're never going to have a thermal file grow in our body because we just don't get hot enough, right? And so that's the real thing to understand. Okay. pH is an important thing to understand, right? Because we can control microorganisms because we just simply know that they have a very narrow pH range to grow in, right? So if we think about this for a minute, right? Um, so those things that are low pH, right, less than seven, um, are considered acidic because they have higher concentration of hydrogen, right? And then those things that are above seven, right, are considered alkaline or basic because they have a lower concentration of hydrogen, but really higher concentration of hydroxyl, right? So bacteria, they grow optimally between a pH of six and eight, right? So they're not going to grow in orange juice. They're not going to grow in coffee. They're not going to grow in Coca-Cola. Those are just too acidic for them. If you've ever thought about these organisms growing in those things, you've never seen one. And if you don't believe me, take a can of Coke, spit in it, put it over a side, and just watch it for a little while. The bacteria will not grow, and it's too acidic, right? But the yeast will, right? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of sugar in a in Coca-Cola, and it's acidic, and the yeast love it because yeast and molds grow better at, at lower pHs, right? So that's really an interesting thing to think about how that might work, right? So um, we know that uh, our colleague Devin is, likes to work with fungi, and she can tell you about the pHs that they prefer, right? And so fungi as a whole are going to prefer more acidic pHs. That's why bacteria will never grow on your orange, right? But sometime when you buy oranges and stick them into your crisper, and then you forget about them, and you might say, well, I really want an orange, and you go to get one, and of course it's all covered with all this green mold on it. That's because the fungi like acidic conditions. Now, there are some organisms that uh, cannot handle anything uh, outside of the normal range, right? So here is an alga, right? Euglena mutabilis, and it is uh, an acidophile. It lacks acidic conditions. It like pH is between zero and one. That's really acidic. So if you take that and you put that in any other pH, even a pH of three, they're going to die very quickly. They cannot handle that. So one of the in most interesting things that I always tried to teach my folks when I was in pharmaceuticals is one of the easiest ways to control microorganisms is to understand their pH range and then keep the environment at either a slightly lower or a slightly higher pH range than what they could handle. And you wouldn't have very much growth, right? And you could do that at home too, right? So there's this, uh, there's this idea, it's this, this what we call alternation of, of uh, sanitizer, alternation and cleaning uh, agents. And what you could do one week is use a 10% pleat solution, right? And that's an alkaline solution, right? And then the next week, acidify the bleach, and you just simply take that bleach solution. It has to be freshly made, but take that bleach solution and add about half a cup of vinegar to it, right? Now you've acidified the bleach, and the organisms can't handle the change in pH. So just doing that at home, you could really control um, whatever, whatever might be growing on your countertops or your cutting boards or whatever, right? Just so you know, I'm not a proponent for using uh, wooden cutting boards because they have too many little pores in them unless they're sealed completely but plastic is better or some type of tile is better because they're a flat surface and the bacteria can't hide in those different pores and create niches. okay all right so osmotic pressure and so really um, we're looking not so much at a hypotonic environment, although that would work, but that's really hard to get in in food or in the body, right? In foods, we can get a hypertonic environment, and when we have that hypertonic environment, then if we have a cell, then the cells are just simply going to lose water to the environment because there's more there's more solute in the environment and they won't be able to grow. There are some organisms like Staphylococcus aureus that we consider a halophile. 
So Staphylococcus aureus is a halophile. That's a beautiful word. Halophile means that it can it can tolerate high salt concentrations. And so Staphylococcus aureus can tolerate salt up to about 10%, right? Therefore, um, even when you think you might have um, control the types of organisms that might grow on your food, if you are trying to protect that food from Staph aureus, then you got to have your salt up to 10%. Now we don't really do that because that'd be too salty for us, but we could take a 2% salt solution or brine. Brine is a salt solution and you can buy all kinds of different foods in brine. But if you increase it, then you're really going to affect the gram negative organisms like E. coli and salmonella and shigella and a bunch of other organisms like that. And so we'll, we'll do that to try to cut down on those organisms that can cause diarrheal diseases and not so much with Staph aureus because Staph aureus is a halophile and you can't really stop it, right? It's, it's If it's going to be there, and it's typically going to be there because it, the food stuff got contaminated from somebody who's a carrier like me or somebody else, right? And so it's really interesting to think about how that works, right? And so there have been lots of cases where, like for Thanksgiving one year, um, the governor of Texas had a big banquet and they had a lot of food left over and they gave that to one of the food banks. And uh, then there was an outbreak of staphylococcal food poisoning, right? So that happens. But it's interesting to think about that if you, if I was to ask the question, which holiday has the highest incidence of staphylococcal food poisoning, most people would think Thanksgiving or Christmas, but that's not the case. It is the 4th of July. And that's because a lot of people will make potato salad or something like that, and they will have contaminated it with Staph aureus. And then they take the potato salad to a picnic with a bunch of people, and they leave the potato salad at ambient conditions, which is really warm, and Staph aureus goes crazy, produces toxins, and then you eat the, you eat the food, and you come down with staphylococcal food poisoning, right? So this is just really looking at the differences between your hypertonic environment, right? Where the organisms um, lose water and the hypotonic environment, right? Where the water comes into the cell, right? Still could be deadly for the cells, but we are much more interested in a hypertonic environment, right? Salted fish, right? Even honey, um, sweet and condensed milk, they're not going to have because of the sugar. So you can have a hypertonic environment with sugar also, right? So just think about all the sugar in cereal that you buy, like Fruit Loops or whatever. Those are all controlling organisms because of they have a hypertonic environment. It's not just salts, it can be sugars also. Honey is really great uh, for controlling infections if you don't if you're out and about in the wilderness and you get you somehow or another have a, a wound that you have and you don't have anything to, to treat it with but you can find a you find a, a honeycomb with bees in it um, get a little bit of that honey and put it on your wound and at least you have a fighting chance of not letting an infection get into that wound Right, so that's a really great way uh, to think about that. Uh, ancient people have used honey for a long time to fight infection, right? And there's medicinal honey now that can be sold if we have problems with bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. A lot, a lot of organisms, a lot of places may use, especially if they don't have a lot of money, they will use honey to try to try to stop them. There's been all kinds of movies and things like that that have shown people using honey to do those kinds of things. So we can use that. We understand what they need uh, for to grow and we understand what can limit their growth, what, what factors can affect their growth, right? The one thing that I'm not going to talk about is concentration of nutrients, but I think you'll understand that um, the, the more nutrients are in environment, the more growth you're going to have to a certain point, because if you have so many nutrients, a lot of sugar, then you're going to cause that hypertonic environment and the organisms will not grow. Okay.
So as we begin to get close to closing out um, today's lecture, I want to talk about the ecology and how organisms, because almost all organisms are in some type of relationship with another organism, right? And a lot of these shared relationships are called symbiotic or symbioses, and they really all kind of involve the interaction or the nutritional interactions, right? So they're sharing nutrients somehow or another. And I made reference to that on your first take home exam, right? Uh, where we had this, where we had these uh, organisms kind of growing around the roots. You had a filamentous mold and this organism, a bacterium, right? They were growing and they were actually sharing those nutrients that were associated with the root tips, right? But also fixing nitrogen and fixing carbon to those roots so they could live. So they were, those three organisms were all in a relationship that involved nutrients, right? Here we have a pond and the pond you can see is, is being heated up. There's a water valve that's spewing steam into it. So that pond is really warm and you have lots of nutrients in there. So the microbes are just going crazy, right? You have bacteria and algae and all kinds of other organisms growing in this particular pond because of the sharing of nutrients, right? So symbiosis is a term that we use to, to explain the relationship between organisms, right? And, and their partnerships in order to survive, right? Now, these don't have to be obligatory, um, but in some cases they are, right? And so if we think about how that might happen, there are three different types of symbiotic relationships. Mutualism is one. So mutualism is the relationship between two different organisms and both of the organisms mutually benefit from the relationship. So these up here are lichens and lichens are the relationship between uh, the, the latest paper that I read are three different, three different, oops, lichens, three different uh, fungi and an alga. Right, the algae produces glucose from photosynthesis, but the three different species of fungi protect the algae and each other from these particular things being damaged. It's gonna be interesting to see how the lichens fare. I have lots of lichens in my backyard. I'm interested to see how they're gonna fare these uh, almost seven days of, of really, really a hard freeze, right? So I'm really interested to see how they survive because I didn't try to protect them at all. I did try to protect my fruit trees and other things, but not the lichens, <laughs> just too many of them, right? So we'll see how they go. But this is a mutualistic relationship between fungi and an alga. The alga produces the sugar, glucose, and the fungi protect the algae, right? And so you have this mutualistic relationship. We also have mutualism um, between the pollinators and a lot of species of plants, right? Where the pollinators will come in there, they'll take up the the substrate that they can use to to build their honeycombs and honey. While while there, they pick up uh, the the pollen and then they can pollinate other other um, uh, plants as they go around and visit all these different plants, right? I'm a little bit worried about the bee population. So when I first moved in to my place out here in Oak Hill, um, the springs and summers were just filled with bee activity, right? There are hundreds of bees all over the place in my backyard. I haven't seen very many in the last two years, so I'm a little bit worried about them, right? But so we do have a couple of people in the neighborhood who have active beehives. And so hopefully they've survived the the freezing temperatures, and then we'll see some of that activity as we get close to spring. Right. Another type of symbiotic relationship is called commensalism. And commensalism is the relationship between two organisms where one of the organism benefits, but the other one is neither harmed nor benefited. And so here you have a whale and on the whale, I don't know if you can notice them, but there's some barnacle growing here. The barnacle have a place to hang out and live. They can propagate there, but it doesn't bother the whale and the whale doesn't really care, right? So the barnacle, those organisms that, that are growing on the whale themselves are have a, have a place. They, they are benefiting, but the whale isn't really benefiting. Here's shark and the shark 
there are these remora that kind of hang out with the shark, right? So now some people will say this is mutualistic. I still think it's commensalistic. So here you have um, a shark and when it takes a meal, right? There's a lot of scraps of nutrients, pieces of fish or whatever in the water column. And these fish, when you, the shark's about to attack, these fish scatter so they don't get <laughs> confused with lunch. And then they come back and they'll take all whatever's left over. So just by hanging on with the shark, they are um, benefiting from that relationship where they're taking the scraps of water. Some of them have been known to get in around the gills and around the teeth and the shark doesn't really bother them and they really kind of floss the teeth, if you will, right? And so it's pretty cool to think about. But to me, this is still a commensalistic relationship. The remora, the fish, are the fish are benefiting from the relationship, but the shark really isn't benefiting from them hanging out. They're just hanging out. Right? Here is the last example. This is a bromeliad, right? And we have bromeliads here in Texas. They're called ball moss. So they're growing on the trees themselves. They're epiphytes, right? And the epiphytes are growing on the surface of the trees, but they're not really taking nutrients from the tree, right? So they're not really hurting the trees. Now, sometimes they can get so many on a branch that they can kind of shadow the leaves, and then therefore the leaves don't benefit and that particular branch dies. So in that case, they could have a negative impact on the tree, but mostly <clears throat> they're just kind of growing there. They're not really uh, affecting anything. A cousin to these things, uh, these bromeliads, are pineapples, right? And so it's pretty interesting to think about how a pineapple can do that. There is a parasitic plant that grows on the trees, mostly on things like um, uh, the Arizona ashes, and those are mistletoe. Right Now mistletoe does attach to the trees, and so mistletoe really is a parasite. So the last type of symbiotic relationship is a parasite. And a parasite itself is an organism, of course, is a, is a symbiotic relationship between two organisms. One of them benefits a relationship, but at the expense of the other, right? So here you have a roundworm, right? And the roundworms can get into the intestinal tract and other parts of the body. They can take nutrients, but they harm the host, right? You or me or dog or whatever, right? Heartworms. And then here's a tick. Right, the tick, you can see it's embedded, it's proboscis into this animal, and it's taking a blood meal. Uh, it's benefiting from the relationship, right? But the other organism, whatever it might be, uh, is really being harmed by it. And so in that case, uh, you can see it's a parasite. A mistletoe, mistletoe is a parasite. It embeds in tissues into the xylem and the phloem of the tree that it's infecting and it's taking those particular nutrients from that tree at the detriment of a tree, it's making the tree weaker, right? So a long time ago, we tried to figure out how we could profit from mistletoe, right? Make it, so we started kissing under the mistletoe during Christmas, right? Because that's its active growing uh, time. Uh, but of course it just wasn't, it just wasn't a big hit. And so nobody wants to pay for mistletoe because you can go outside and just get it almost anywhere, right? Um, there was, so if you have any questions about mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism, please let me know. There was another term here that I forgot to mention, which is satellitism. And satellitism is when you have an organism growing someplace, and one of its end products of metabolic is needed by another organism, right? So. It produces this nutrition or protective factors for these other organisms, right? And so in that case, that's a type of commensalism, right? Because that organism is benefiting from another organism making an end product of its metabolic pathway. And we can talk about this more if you want to. Um, just let me know. Okay. So as we begin to as we begin to leave, um, there is some other terms, right? Synergism is when two organisms are again in a relationship, but they're producing um, they're producing end products of metabolism that each other need, right? And so they benefit from that particular they benefit from that particular relationship. I don't like to use synergism with both biological mechanisms. I would much rather use it 
to talk about uh, the effect of drugs and how drugs might work um, synergistically together. And we'll take a look. We'll take a look at some of those when we talk about control of microorganisms with things like antibiotics, right? And then antagonism is another. Antagonism is when you have an organism growing and it's producing a molecule that's not allowing other organisms to get near it. So here you have a plate uh, and on this plate you can see that there's mold growing um, all over the plate, right? But you can also see that there's a bacillus growing in the middle of the plate and the mold is not growing anywhere near that bacillus. And that's because that bacillus is producing an antifungal, right? And that particular antifungal is called amphotericin B, right? Amphotericin B is a pretty strong antifungal. Amphotericin B, the B stands for bacillus because the genus bacillus produces the antifungal amphotericin, right? So the B in amphotericin B um, is, stands for bacillus, right? And so you can see this is antagonism because that, that bacterium in the middle, this guy is producing an antifungal and the fungi are not growing around it. Now in our bodies, on our bodies and in our bodies, we also have a lot of antagonism because there's lots of organisms growing in there and those organisms are really competing, competing for space and nutrients, right? And so if we think about them, that's a really great thing to think about. The normal microbiota of the body, right, is antagonistic to any other organisms that are not adapted to our body. So let's say a salmonella or shigella or listeria, you'd eat it with your food. A lot of times they don't really start to cause problems with this because the normal, if you have a normal healthy population in the intestinal tract, of all these other organisms that are in there, they just simply can outcompete for space and nutrients to those potentially invading pathogens that can make us sick. And so in that case, um, we're protected by the normal organisms that are our intestinal tract because there are billions and billions of organisms in our intestinal tract. So just think about the fact that when you produce feces, about 65% of that feces by dry weight is microbial by nature, right? And that's pretty interesting to think about. So um, we will, next time we meet, we will be talking about the control of microorganisms, right? So I've talked a little bit of today, I've talked a little bit about the population formula and how to use it, talked about factors that can affect growth, right? We had a little discussion about that. Then we started to talk about the different types of symbiotic relationships, mostly um, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. But then also in there, we talked about um, satellitism, and we talked about synergism and antagonism. Be sure you know those terms. And then we talked about how um, antagonistically, right, some of the microbes can inhibit other organisms from growing near them. And then we left, we're going to leave today with the discussion we just had on the normal microbiota of our bodies, especially of our intestinal tract, but you could say on the skin, right? And the reason that we have so few infections of our intestinal tract is because the normal inhabitants of our intestinal tract keep us healthy and outcompete for space and nutrients for those potential pathogens that are coming into our body and potentially could make us sick. So I want you to think about the fact that only less than 0.1% of all microorganisms out there are bad for us, right? Almost all of them are good for us, right? And so I've given you some examples of how they're good. And we're going to continue to look at these, right? Just every time you think about stuff growing in your backyard or wherever they're growing, know that those things are growing because the microbes are actively involved in the mitigation of nutrients, right? And so with that, I, am, uh, I have finished this particular lecture on um, the second part of nutrition and growth, which is really centered around uh, using the population equation and then factors that can affect growth and then ecology and symbiotic relationships, right? Please let me know if you have any questions.
we are done for today. Um, Provi out. Take care. Bye-bye.